very aware of the fact that beta blockers have been around for over 50 years now. Back in the early 60s, propranolol first appeared. And for the majority of that time, they've gone from strength to strength. But in recent times, over the last seven or eight years, queries have been raised against the beta blockers, uh, particularly coming from the NICE committee in the UK and from the guideline committees in USA. So what are the facts? Let's step back a little and try to see what the beta blockers actually do and don't do. Uh, those are my disclosures. Now, just a, a very brief reminder uh, that hypertension uh, is number one risk factor uh, globally, uh, and uh, it's ahead of smoking and high cholesterol. So it's a condition, and we all know that, that needs to be taken very seriously. Now, <clears throat> in deciding where the beta blockers fit in uh, to th this uh, conundrum, uh, we, as often is the case, go back to good old Framingham in Boston, Massachusetts. And about 10 years ago, they published uh, the <clears throat> data on patho the pathophysiology of essential hypertension. And after 45 to 50 years follow-up, they concluded that the appearance in a normal population of diastolic hypertension uh, occurred mainly in the young to middle age and was closely related to obesity. <clears throat> in the elderly, uh, we have a situation reflecting arterial stiffness and aging uh, of the arteries. So we have two quite different types of essential hypertension. Let me say straight away now, I'll be concentrating on the left-hand side of this table because this is where first-line beta blockers uh, belong. <clears throat> now, I mentioned the obesity factor uh, linked to the appearance of diastolic hypertension. Now, as the BMI increases, so does the, uh, uh, the severity and appearance of hypertension. The greater, this is on central obesity, and the greater the waist circumference, i.e. the greater the central obesity, uh, <clears throat> the greater is the increase in sympathetic nerve activity, as assessed by MSNA. So, central obesity linked to high sympathetic tone. <clears throat> Now, this is a 24-hour measure of plasma, nor epinephrine, uh, over 24 hours in patients with hypertension, uh, middle-aged patients, and you can see clearly that the increase in sympathetic activity is for the whole 24-hour period. In particular, in the waking period, the so-called vulnerable period. <clears throat> Now, this is an important study uh, looking at the effect of increased sympathetic nerve activity separate from hypertension. Now, this is a group of over 600 middle-aged hypertensive subjects, followed up for six to seven years, and plasma norepinephrine was measured in all of these patients, and the follow-up time was over six years. And independent of high blood pressure, uh, we can see quite clearly that increased sympathetic nerve activity is, is linked to an increased risk of all-cause death. So when we see our patients in, in the clinic, we have to think two things. We have to think control of high blood pressure and how do we address this sympathetic nerve activity conundrum. Now, we can't all go in our clinics and take blood and measure plasma or epinephrine, but we can measure the surrogate for this, and this is resting heart rate. And again, we come back to good old Framingham, who showed after uh, 36 years follow-up, <clears throat> uh, resting heart rate was closely, increasing resting heart rate was closely linked to an increase in coronary heart disease, cardiovascular disease, and all-cause death. So <clears throat> the higher the resting heart rate, uh, the greater the risk of premature death. That was for the men, and for the stronger sex, the females, a similar trend, but at a lower risk level. So for both men and women, high resting heart rates are linked to premature death. 
So if this is true, is it important the way we lower blood pressure? Because if a drug lowers blood pressure, but at the same time increases sympathetic nerve activity, is that a problem? Now, we know that three major classes of antihypertensive agents do increase sympathetic nerve activity. The diuretics, the uh, dihydropyridine calcium antagonists, and ARBs. Now, it's the same uh, long-term outlook for all three of these drugs. I'm using the ARB as an example uh, of these three drug classes. Now, here's data showing that an ARB uh, is associated with a marked increase in muscle sympathetic activity and plasma norepinephrine. Now, is this important? Well, these uh, are two meta-analyses published about 10 years ago, uh, looking at both ACE inhibitors and ARBs and the risk of number one killer in myocardial infarction, two to three times more common than stroke in the younger patient. So what is uh, the risk of ARBs on the risk of number one killer? And these two meta-analyses show clearly from Strauss and from Sukiyaki that there is an increased risk of myocardial infarction uh, with ARBs. Ew. Sorry. With the ACE inhibitor, though, for a similar blood pressure control, there is a significant 15% reduction in the risk of number one killer, MI. So it, it seems possible that drugs that increase sympathetic nerve activity may not be as effective as drugs that don't in, risk, in reducing number one killer. Now, the roadmap study is an important, this was done after the meta-analyses that I've just shown you, a very important study in 4,500 patients with high normal blood pressure, but with type 2 diabetes, who were middle-aged, and they were obese. And it's quite clearly that over a three-year follow-up period, placebo compared to the ARB, there is a significant increase in the risk of cardiovascular death and non-significant increases in sudden death and MI. So this is something of a worry for uh, the, a the ARB class of drugs uh, because this is something of a surprise to many uh, doctors. Now, what about the beta blocker story? I think the easy way to look at this is to consider uh, the meta-analyses done um, from Kahn and McAllister that take age into account. Now, on this slide, we are comparing the beta blocker with placebo and looking at the effect of beta blockers on the combined endpoint of death, stroke, and MI. So let's look at the younger group now, young as in less than 60, and it's clear that the beta blocker significantly reduces the risk of death, stroke, and MI. And even in the elderly, there is a trend for the beta blocker being somewhat superior to placebo. But when we look against active therapies, uh, we, we can see clearly that in the younger group of patients, there is a trend favoring the beta blocker against other drugs uh, in terms of reducing the risk of death, stroke, and MI. But in the elderly, we now have the bad news for the beta blockers because there is now a significant increase in the risk of uh, death, stroke, and MI compared to the comparator. So if we believe this meta-analysis, which is quite comprehensive, a beta blocker should not be your first-line choice for the treatment of the elderly systolic hypertensive. So <clears throat> how are we to view beta blockers? One of the reasons why we've been slow to realize the important benefits of beta blockers in the young to middle age is the important interaction with smoking. Now, <clears throat> these are hard endpoints studies published uh, uh, some 20 years or more ago 
but they took the smoking status into account. Now, we're now looking at the uh, comparison of oxpranolol versus diuretic, propranolol versus placebo diuretic, and the MAPI study, metoprolol diuretic. And you can see quite clearly that the beta blocker in non-smokers is superior to the diuretic and placebo in reducing number one killer myocardial infarction in blue. These are the non-smokers. But unless you take smoking into account, you will not uh, be aware of these massive benefits because look what happens in the smokers. This benefit is negated. Now, how do we explain this, this vital uh, cigarette smoking interaction with beta blockers? Well, during when we compare smoking and sham smoking, and the effect on norepinephrine and epinephrine, we see clearly that the, during the smoking period, over a 30-minute period, there is a marked increase in norepinephrine and epinephrine. Now, let us just take a little closer look at epinephrine. Go back to your medical, medical school days, and remember, epinephrine stimulates beta-1, beta-2, and alpha. So if you give a non-selective beta blocker and block beta 1 and 2, in theory, you are left with alpha constriction and an increase in blood pressure. Is this true or not? Well, this is an important study published in the early 1990s looking at blood pressure change uh, in the presence of high adrenaline or epinephrine levels with the various beta blockers. Here is the control blood pressure, we can see with non-selective beta blockers, such as propranolol, there is a 30 millimeter increase in blood pressure in the presence of high epinephrine, i.e. during the smoking period. Moderate selectivity, such as uh, metoprolol or etanolol, a 9 to 10 millimeter increase, this can be avoided by going high beta-1 selective with a drug such as bisoprolol. So uh, there is a very important interaction with various beta blockers and smoking and high epinephrine levels. Now, let's leave that aspect of the beta blocker story and come to ACE inhibitors and how do they compare with the beta blocker. There's only one classic study where this has been addressed, the so-called UK UK PDS study in young to middle-aged patients with type 2 diabetes and hypertension. <clears throat> there was a comparison with atenolol and com uh, captopril compared to less tight control of blood pressure, which was about 10 millimeters, uh, 10 over 5 less. So how do these two drugs compare to less tight control of blood pressure? Now, looking at these eight primary endpoints, and up is good, we can see that blue, the beta blocker, in all cases, including um, MI, stroke, peripheral arterial disease, uh, eye and kidney problems, and heart failure, all of the trends favor the beta blocker. Now, bear in mind, the NICE committee in the UK have just removed uh, beta blockers as first-line therapy and favor favor captopril. This is the one and only hard endpoint study showing that the beta blocker is at least as good as the ACE. And the problem, people think they don't reduce stroke, a 50% reduction of stroke with the beta blocker. After 10 year, uh, 20 years follow-up, uh, importantly, the beta blocker is now significantly superior to the ACE inhibitor in terms of uh, prevention of all-cause death, 20 years follow-up. So here's the beta blocker over 20 years actually being uh, significantly superior to the ACE inhibitor uh, therapy. So, it's difficult to see where the NICE committee, and, and indeed the American guideline committees, are coming from. Now, just a little quick reminder, because I've been you know, highlighting the myocardial infarction situation with beta blockers preventing it, it's interesting to observe the effect of various therapies on the atheromatous process within the coronary artery. This represents atheroma volume, as assessed by ultrasound, in the presence of statins, 
and beta blockers and control. And it's quite clear that both the statins and beta blockers regress the atheromatous change in the coronary artery. Now this is very important. But we do know that the dangerous atheroma lesion is the unstable lesion. So this is an important study published uh, uh, in the year 2001 from Strahl and colleagues looking at the effect of various uh, aspects of plaque disruption. Oh dear. And we can see when over a, a period of, of one year follow-up, high resting heart rates increase the risk of plaque disruption, which leads on to myocardial infarction. But the presence of a beta blocker markedly, significantly reduces that risk of plaque disruption. And this could well explain why beta blockers in the younger patient prevent number one killer, MI. Now, if this is true, are all beta blockers the same? Well, this is a, a slide showing beta-1, beta-2 selectivity ratios. But first, let me explain this red column here. It's a pure beta-2 blocker. You can't prescribe it to your patients. It's not available. It's a research tool. But if you gave a pure beta-2 blocker to your hypertensive patients, there will be an increase of about seven over five millimeters of mercury. So beta-2 blockade increases blood pressure. So when we now look at the spectrum of various beta blockers from non-selective propranolol through to high selective bisoprolol, uh, what effect does this have on how the patient reacts? Now, this is a classic study done in Cambridge, 30 minutes down the road from where I live in the UK, and it's taken a group of middle-aged uh, hypertensive patients, and they, under double-blind, randomized crossover conditions, they're given all of these drugs that you can see here, including a beta blocker, bisoprolol. And after one month's therapy on all of these drugs, patients taking all of the drugs, the best control of blood pressure significantly was the beta blocker propranolol, uh, bisoprolol. Now, no ARB is there. What happens when we look at ARB? Since that publication, there have been two comparisons with bisoprolol and an ARB, and in both of these uh, uh, publications, bisoprolol was superior in lowering blood pressure to the ARB, and the supposed renal protective aspect of the ARB uh, was not actually seen as measured by creatinine clearance. So not all uh, drugs uh, lower blood pressure equally. Not all beta blockers are the same in their p potential to lower blood pressure. Now, what happens when we compare various beta blockers? Now, this is a classic study done by Fritz Bueller way back in the 1980s, where he compared bisoprolol and atenolol, but took smoking into account. And in the non, the up is good control of blood pressure, diastolic less than 96. You can see that the response is better on the beta block on bisoprolol compared to atenolol, but in the smokers, there is a massive advantage on using a highly beta-1 selective agent compared to a, a non. Now, this advantage of uh, bisoprolol over atenolol, uh, looking at the 24-hour clock, it, the advantage is maintained over the whole 24-hour period, uh, bisoprolol being superior to atenolol. Importantly, the vulnerable period, when we wake in the morning, maximal risk of MI, there is still this marked advantage of high beta-1 selectivity. What about central uh, blood pressure? Is many people feel that beta blockers are poor uh, at lowering central uh, blood pressure. This is a publication of a year or two back comparing bisoprolol and etanolol. This is, this is in the aortic area, central blood pressure, and we can see that bisoprolol is superior to etanolol in lowering central blood pressure. 
Now, I've almost come to the end of my presentation, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what about the safety of beta blockers? A lot of people are concerned about the potential of beta blockers uh, causing problems for patients with obstructive airways disease, asthma. So this is an important study published back way back in the 80s comparing bisoprolol with etanolol and placebo and measuring airways resistance up is bad news, bronchoconstriction. And it's quite clear that for equal beta-1 blockade, uh, the less selective of the two drugs tends to increase airways resistance, i.e. bronchoconstriction, compared to the more highly selective drug, which has a relative safety for the asthmatic patient. Now, there is a lot of worry about the beta blockers and their potential to cause metabolic disturbance. And so this is an important study. Uh, red is bisoprolol, blue and white are before and after. And it's clear that bisoprolol, high beta-1 selectivity, has no effect on blood glucose or HbA1. And also, uh, when we look at blood uh, lipids, cholesterol, triglycerides, HDL, LDL, you can see clearly that high beta-1 selectivity with a drug like bisoprolol uh, has no effect on plasma uh, lipids. Now, my last slide before I come to my summary, Mr. Chairman. Many people are concerned about the potential for beta blockers to diminish sexual function. Uh, now, what we have to realize is that placebo is a very powerful drug in this respect. So we have to subtract the placebo effect to actually decide whether or not a drug or a particular beta blocker has a problem with sexual dysfunction. So when we subtract placebo, uh, the beta blocker that has a, a, a sizable problem is carvedilol. It blocks beta 1, beta 2, and alpha. So that's the problem drug, but non-selective propranolol to a degree atenolol, a small increase, you can avoid this problem with sexual dysfunction uh, with drugs such as bisoprolol uh, and nibivolol. So what can we summarize and conclude? Well, hypertension in young middle age is closely linked to obesity and high sympathetic nerve activity. High SNA and high heart rates, independent of blood pressure, are associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular death. Antihypertensive agents that increase SNA, i.e. Uh, diuretic therapy, dihydropyridine calcium blockers, and ARBs, do not reduce and might even increase the risk of MI in the young to middle-aged hypertensive patient. In young to middle age, beta blockers reduce the risk of stroke by about 50% and MI by 35%, certainly in non-smokers for the non-selective beta blockers. Smoking is linked to high epinephrine blood levels, which, in the presence of a non- or poorly selected beta blocker, leads to a marked increase in systolic blood pressure. And this can be avoided by going uh, high beta-1 selective with a drug such as bisoprolol. Uh, beta, blockers are at, beta blockers are at least as effective as ACE inhibitors, UK PDS, in reducing cardiovascular endpoints, and after 20 years follow-up, are superior in preventing all-cause death. And finally, what about the choice of beta blocker in the younger middle-aged hypertensive patient? High beta-1 selectivity, for example, a drug such as bisoprolol, results in, A, the best control of blood pressure. It also lowers central aortic blood pressure, is at least as good as ACE inhibitors in reversing LVH. It avoids metabolic disturbance. There's a reduced risk of bronchoconstriction and sexual dysfunction. And there's avoidance of the smoking uh, epinephrine hypertensive reaction. And on that note, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you for being a very patient audience.